Um, you should have a handout on a seat nearby. Uh, it, it's not terribly important, but it's just looking at some of these historical things, it's quite useful to have the key dates and things laid out. It's hard to hold them in your mind sometimes and, and said just to have them with you. So uh, I've given you that. I hope it's, hope, hope it's helpful uh, for you. All right, uh, so Zach this morning was uh, talking about Gregory of, of Nyssa uh, in the sort of mid to late 4th century. We're going to sort of slightly oddly take a jump back in time now to the early 4th century. And we're going to talk a little bit about Constantine uh, the Great. But first, just a couple of quotes that I want to, to read uh, to you. Uh, and don't worry, I'll explain what these quotes are, but just listen to them for now. Then Caesar from the Julian stock shall rise, whose empire, ocean, and whose fame the skies alone shall bound, whom, fraught with eastern spoils, our heaven, the just reward of human toils, securely shall repay with rites divine, and incense shall ascend before his sacred throne. Then dire debate and impious war shall cease, and the stern age be softened into peace. The mighty Caesar waits his vital hour, impatient for the world and grasps his promised power. But next behold the youth of form divine, Caesar himself exalted in his line, Augustus promised oft and long foretold, sent to the realm that Saturn ruled of old. Born to restore a better age of gold, Afric and India shall his power obey. He shall extend his propagated sway beyond the solar year without the starry way, where Atlas turns the rolling heavens around, and his broad shoulders with their lights are crowned. To understand the story and the significance of the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great, we actually have to go back well before his time, uh, well before the time he recaptured Rome from tyranny, beyond, uh, past his, uh, his conversion to Christianity. Uh, we have to go back, in fact, beyond his predecessor, Diocletian, and the brutal persecution that came on the church in his day. Our story will take us through all of these things, but we can't start there. To begin to understand Constantine the Great, we need to go back uh, 300 years at least before his birth to examine some of the foundations of Rome itself. I just uh, read two quotations there. Uh, both of those quotes were written by the poet Virgil, and they're from his epic poem, The Aeneid. The poem tells us the tale of its hero, uh, Aeneas, uh, cast off into the wide sea, escaping the downfall of his home. His home, the pious, the noble, uh, and tragically gullible city of Troy. Fleeing the flames of his fallen city, uh, his wife lost to the battle behind him, his elderly father clinging to his back, Aeneas begins his voyage, his quest in search of destiny, in search of what it was promised to him by the chief god Jupiter for his piety. A queen, a kingdom, and descendants to whom will be given all authority and power and the fealty of the nations. Aeneas' quest is a quest to establish his family as the central family of the cosmos, to make his household the household of the gods, to make history his story. A story that would begin to be fulfilled, according to these prophecies uh, in the Aeneid, in a promised son, a descendant who would bring down the stars and bear them on his shoulders. Caesar Augustus. The pen of Virgil in those quotes there prophesies his empire, Caesar Augustus's empire, one that stretches from sea to sea and prophesies his throne, receiving the incense of the nations. It prophesies that he will bring back an age of golden peace and glory. He will bear the government of the whole world uh, on his shoulders as the stars in their heavenly spheres settle on his shoulders, crowning him with the authority of the divines. This myth is what the imperial might of Rome was founded on, the gospel of Caesar Augustus, the cosmic destiny of the house of Aeneas, and therefore the eternal glory of Rome. Now, uh, the fact that this epic poem was commissioned by Augustus himself shouldn't be taken by us to, to be a cynical propaganda ploy. 
Uh, we can often look, we can look back with modern lenses on that and assume that he put out a fake story that he didn't really believe, but never mind the plebs would. Now, we have every reason to suppose that he believed it himself. He believed that if, if he was pious, if he was diligent in sacrifice, if he was faithful to the gods, then in return they would give him this, dominion of the world. For Caesar Augustus, the history of Rome was the history of the world. The destiny of the household of Aeneas was the destiny of the cosmos. Now, of course, uh, as with everything human, the fervor of this vision didn't hold forever. Uh, and so in the centuries leading up from uh, Augustus uh, through to the ascension of Constantine to the imperial throne, uh, the glory of Rome waxed and it waned. Uh, it became swamped in corruption and rivalry and excess uh, so that the gospel of the coming reign of the household of Aeneas never, ever came to pass. But that doesn't mean, however, that the hope of it faded. And that brings us then to the decades immediately leading up to Constantine to the reign of the emperor uh, Diocletian, the predecessor, or one of the predecessors uh, of Constantine. Uh, now, the name uh, Diocletian is an, is an ominous name for those who know something about this period of church history. Diocletian wanted to restore this faded splendor of Rome. Uh, and key to that was establishing himself as the new Aeneas, the true heir of the Augustan spirit. He viewed himself as emperor, as the one destined to recommit Rome to the favor of the gods. That's what he was going to do. He was going to do it through the traditional Roman piety of sacrifice upon sacrifice, and thereby was going to receive their gift of glory. He was going to receive their gift of the restored promise of eternal dominion to Rome. Once again, with Diocletian, the story of history was going to be the Roman story. He was going to recommit it to that purpose. And the gods, in turn, in, in, in response to his sacrifice, they were going to make the Roman throne the throne of the world once more. But something dramatic had changed between the time of Augustus, 300 years earlier, and Diocletian's day. The truth is that during that intervening time, the throne of the cosmos, the real throne of the cosmos, had received already its rightful occupant. That supposed gift of the gods to Aeneas, to Diocletian, to Augustus, was no longer, if it ever was, the gods to give. And so though Diocletian longed for the Roman throne to fulfill its cosmic destiny, though he longed to make the imperial throne the throne of heaven and earth combined, by, the, by his time it was already far, far too late. Somebody already sat there. That, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, in what formed one of the central problems for Roman rule in Diocletian's day and the, cent and the decades and centuries leading up to it, that Lord, who really sat on the throne of the cosmos, he already had his people everywhere, all over the place. And his people were never going to bow to a pretender to the throne. Diocletian knew it. He was acutely aware of this so-called Christian problem, the problem, the, the great policy struggle uh, of his day. How does an emperor deal with law-abiding citizens, good citizens in many ways, whose ultimate allegiance is to another king? The Christian problem was very evident to Diocletian. It stood in the way of his, his program. And crucially for Diocletian uh, and his commitment to Roman piety and the favor of the gods, uh, how do you deal with a people who just will not sacrifice to those gods? No matter how light a thing you try and make it, try and add it on as a little side activity, oh yes, go and worship your god, but just, you know, come and do the sacrifices when we tell you to. No matter how light you try and make it, how do you deal with people who just won't do it? If you're a Roman emperor who has set his sights on the throne of Rome, becoming the throne of the nations, the throne of thrones, uh, and one who knows that the crucial element, the uh, crux of that, is the pleasure of the gods, how do you deal with a people who say, well, those gods are not real gods, that throne that you seek is already taken, and no, we will not join in the sacrifices? How do you deal with that Christian problem? Well, this is how... Uh, one of the most brutal persecutions of Christians that the Roman Empire had ever known and would ever know began. 
the great persecution of Diocletian. Uh, this persecution uh, was one of very few sort of general uh, persecutions across the whole Roman Empire. Uh, there had been a, a couple of times when that had been the case, and many, many local persecutions, uh, particular governors who, who had issues with Christians in their territory. But rarely was an edict made by the emperor that mandated persecution across the entire empire. Diocletian issued four such edicts. The first, uh, the first edict stopped Christians from meeting, it commanded that church buildings be destroyed, and it commanded that Christians who had been freed from slavery were sent back into that slavery. Then several months later, Diocletian decreed that every Roman citizen was required to sacrifice to the Roman gods or face imprisonment or death. Uh, now, it, ha it has been noted that, uh, that once the Romans really got into the spirit of it, the creative barbarity of their execution methods were something else. And it's important to understand what the church went through before we get to Constantine. Uh, Christians, uh, they had sharp reeds hammered underneath their fingernails uh, as part of their torture. They were tied to bent trees, which were then allowed to spring back into place, pulling them apart. Uh, Christians were, were whipped, scoured with broken pots, had vinegar poured on the wounds, and then were cooked bit by bit until they finally gave up the ghost. Eventually, things became a little bit less serious, and the executions did stop, but they were replaced with the comparatively trivial punishment of eyes being gouged out and limbs being crippled. We mustn't miss in all of this how central sacrifice was to the Romans and to Diocletian and his rule. There was no sort of belief in, in, in the myth of a religiously neutral civic space here. They knew that all of their Roman life was religious, was related to religion in some way. And the religious disobedience of the Christian was civil, civil disobedience and vice versa. If these uh, Christians would not get with the program, if they were not going to sacrifice to the gods and so undermine the Augustan vision of Rome at the glorious, prosperous center of history, then they would become the sacrifice themselves. This is how the persecution was viewed. And though the severity of persecution varied from place to place and time to time, the edicts themselves mandating persecution lasted for between 8 to 11 years, depending on where you were. But no matter how Diocletian raged, we get the sense that he knew and feared deep down that the story of the universe had already got away from him that it was never going to be about Rome. Uh, it would never ultimately be about the household of Aeneas. Uh, shortly before his persecution began, uh, he had been shaken by uh, the sudden silencing of the seers and the oracles that he relied on for much of his policy. That is an ominous omen for someone so reliant on the favour of the gods. And he was especially shaken when they seemed to have failed uh, by the actions of Christians who were standing there on the sidelines. And besides, uh, the oracles who had not fallen silent were whispering that they had been hindered by righteous ones, which Diocletian concluded must mean the Christians in his empire. So it seems that Diocletian knew on some level that the offspring of Aeneas would never be the promised rulers of the world. He sensed that this was getting away from him. And his suspicions were true. Uh, for God, the true and living God, uh, and not one of the demonic pretender gods of Rome, had already promised that inheritance to the household of another, to the household of Abraham not of Aeneas. And since Virgil had penned those prophecies, that promised son of Abraham had already come. He had already died, risen again, and ascended to the throne above all thrones at the right hand of the Father. Far from being the sort of young conqueror in the prime of life ready to take the world, Aeneas was already old. The vision of Rome was dying by the time Diocletian took the throne. And no matter his aspirations, the keys of death and Hades would never be his to resurrect it from the dead. If he'd read the story of the world aright, Diocletian could have known this. Centuries earlier, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, was given a dream by the God of heaven that revealed to him the rise and fall of Rome. He saw in his day, with the help of one of his courtiers, Daniel, himself a member of the household of Abraham, that the fall of Rome would come at the hands of a kingdom built by God himself. That same Daniel later in his life had a dream in which he saw this. Now, this is from Daniel chapter 7. 
As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. The writing was on the wall for Diocletian, and no matter how brutal his persecution of Christians was, no matter how much he sought to root it out, the leaven of the kingdom of God had been spreading through the dough for 300 years already. And the only option for Aeneas, for Rome, for Diocletian, was to bow before the cornerstone carved by no human hand or be crushed by it. And so that brings us at long last to the 25th of July, 306 AD in Yorkshire. My neck of the woods. At the very western and northern fringes of the empire. One of Diocletian's novel policies as emperor had been to split the imperial power into four. There were two Augusti, two senior emperors, one for the west and one for the east, and two junior emperors, the Caesars. And on the 25th of July, 306 AD, in York, the Augustus of the Western Empire, Flavius Valerius Constantius, died. And as he died, he named his son, Constantine, as his successor. The legions who were with him wholeheartedly agreed with the decision. Constantine, therefore, ascended to the imperial power, uh, not though as a sole emperor, not even as a senior emperor. He joined a, a collection, a, a college of four Roman emperors at the time, whose jurisdictions together covered that whole, uh, whole massive empire. And very soon, uh, that four emperors, that collection, became five emperors. A senior emperor, Galerius, whose capital was in the east, three junior emperors, including Constantine himself, and a rebellious usurper emperor, uh, Maxentius, who had claimed rulership of the actual city of Rome and its surrounding territories. And much of the next few years of Roman life revolved around trying to retake Rome from Maxentius. At Severus, one of those junior emperors, tried and failed. At Galerius, the eastern senior emperor, the Augustus, at the most senior emperor, tried and failed. Uh, we don't have all the time to go into all the intricacies of the political situation there at the time. Rest assured that it involved everything you'd expect, all the back and forths, questionable marriage alliances, assassination attempts, ex-emperors who were not really ready to give up their glory days, coming back into business for a little bit of a final, final go at things. That's all there. But the long and short of it is that by 311, Maxentius, the usurper in Rome, had made himself a stench to the city's populace by stealing their wives and slaughtering his opposition. That year, for a variety of reasons, personal and political, he declared war on Constantine. Not long after, the only one keeping this fragile series of rivalries in check, the retired emperor Diocletian himself, died, which queued open war. Constantine, in response to Maxentius, marched his relatively small army towards Rome. He defeated Maxentius in several battles along the way until in October 312, six years after he became a junior emperor of the empire, he was camped near the Milvian Bridge that crossed the river Tiber just outside of Rome. On October the 28th, Maxentius left the fortified city, a bad idea always when you're defending a city, to meet Constantine in battle. He was led along in that stunningly poor military strategy by what he supposed were portents from the gods. His was a religious defense of Rome. October the 28th was the anniversary, you see, of his usurpation of the great city of Rome. It was an auspicious date, and he had it on good good authority that the enemy of Rome would fall in this battle. Now, anyone who's familiar with the Uh, ambiguous nature of the seers and oracles of the ancient world uh, knows that that's not necessarily something to make any sort of decision uh, based on. 
And so he rode out for the honour of Jupiter and for the honour of the Roman pantheon to secure the future of Rome as the eternal city, the one whose story was history's story. And he was sorely defeated. In panic, his troops fled back across the bridge, uh, which collapsed. It had been sabotaged by his own forces. They forgot that in the heat of battle. Ran across the bridge, it collapsed, uh, sending uh, many to their deaths, including Maxentius himself. And for probably the first time in his life, after the battle, Constantine entered Rome. And on his entry, he was greeted with joy by the populace as the liberator of the city. Now, the rules of entering Rome in triumph were clear. All Roman victory was due to the favour of the gods. And so when he enters Rome victorious... The emperor must go immediately to the Capitoline Hill and make sacrifices there of thanksgiving to Jupiter. Anything else would surely risk divine fury and doom uh, for the empire. But something had clearly changed now, for Constantine refused. And instead of riding into battle and then into the city with the old military standards, the sacred regalia of the Roman legions that dedicated them to their gods as divine benefactors, Constantine's forces rode into battle and into the city with a new sign painted on their shields. A he with a ro through the middle. You can see the hand up there for a picture of the symbol. The first two letters of the word Christos, Christ, Something had clearly happened to change this man from a follower of the old Roman military gods to a follower of Christ. And so he rode into Rome, not as a servant of the pantheon of old, not as the divine rule of Jupiter incarnate, but as a Christian emperor. Now, the stories of his conversion vary. The most well-known comes from the 4th century church historian Eusebius, a contemporary of Constantine, who claims to have received the story from Constantine himself, firsthand under oath. Uh, Another comes from Lactantius, a Christian, uh, who was also the tutor of Constantine's sons. Eusebius tells the story of the evening before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. Constantine, knowing just how, how zealous his pagan enemy was in the city, knowing all of the magicians and seers he'd be calling on for victory, called out to God for help. And as the day was waning, Constantine looked at the sky and saw a cross of light in the heavens and the inscription above it, Conquer by this. According to Eusebius, his whole army saw it and were amazed. The sign was then painted on the shields before the battle the next day. Lactantius, for his part, claims that the vision was seen in a dream uh, at an undefined point in time before the battle, not necessarily the day before. Uh, It's possible that Constantine was drawn to and converted to Christianity earlier than 312 when the battle took place. It's also possible that that his father had already been sympathetic uh, to uh, the church's plight during the days of Diocletian's persecution. Certainly, it was much less severe in the realm of, uh, in the domain uh, of Constantius, Constantine's father, than it was in other parts of the empire. It's possible even that some members of his family were already Christians. Uh, There is evidence of some slightly more Christian names in his family tree uh, than than would be expected uh, from a Roman uh, emperor. Whatever happened in the run-up to the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, the church, it seems, breathed a sigh of relief. Though the persecutions in the Western Empire had been formally halted by Constantine the moment he became emperor in 306, uh, and though things had been easier for Christians in Rome itself for a while, the tide uh, always threatened to turn back again towards persecution uh, like that that they'd seen under uh, Diocletian. In fact, despite the so-called Edict of Milan in 313, a year after Constantine's uh, conversion and victory in Rome, which to some degree was an edict that formalized um, toleration of Christians throughout the empire, the Eastern Empire often fell back into low-level persecution through the next decade. Uh, Not quite as serious as as Diocletian's, but uh, not comfortable for the church either. And so for this reason, uh, in fact, amongst several reasons, uh, after a decade of established rule in Rome, Constantine went to war with the Eastern Emperor, um, a man called Licinius, who had started persecuting Christians again, um, uh, to retake Rome, uh, retake the Eastern Empire, sorry, 
um, from, from Licinius. It's worth noting that Licinius explicitly viewed his war against Constantine at this point as a religious war. Uh, Licinius in the east viewed himself as defending the throne of Rome from Christianity, as defending the old Roman gods from a traitor to the old Roman ways, um, and so he used all the old Roman military methods, pre-battle sacrifices, uh, seers, prophecies, magicians, uh, but to no avail. After a series of significant battles, Constantine decisively defeated Licinius uh, at uh, Chrysopolis in 324. And so, for the first time ever, the whole Roman Empire had a Christian emperor. And for the first time ever, it looked like the church was free from the waves of persecution that had come and gone for centuries. Just think, 20 years earlier, just over 20 years earlier, the streets of the empire had been filled with the blood of Christians. The emperor claimed the throne of the universe, and his governors burnt down whole towns of Christians who wouldn't go along with it. But now the church was not only free, but looked on with favour by the emperor himself. This is easy to miss how dramatic a change this is in such a short period of time. The change was so great, in fact, that just one year later, one year after Constantine became a sole emperor of the whole empire, he summoned bishops from across the known world to participate in a church council at Nicaea. He organized transport, he organized security for the council, which in those days is no mean feat. One particularly memorable scene for the bishops at Nicaea was the sight of the the sole emperor of Rome, being met by an elderly Christian whose eyes had been gouged out during the brutal persecution of Diocletian, well within living memory of many in attendance. Constantine, in what can only be described as an act of repentance for the sins of Rome against the Bride of Christ, stooped to kiss the man's empty eye sockets and greeted him not as an enemy, but as a brother. It seemed to many, and I think rightly seemed to many, that Christ had won a great victory on behalf of his people that day. Now, there's much more that can be said about all of these biographical details of Constantine's life, and I will say some of it in a little as we get towards the end of this talk. But before we get there, it would be a mistake, I think, to deny the fact that Constantine is something of a controversial figure to some. And so I'd like to spend a little bit of time trying to touch on some of those objections that people have to this man. Uh, So that's where we'll turn in the next part of this session. Um, Perhaps fortunately for you all, we don't have the time to go into all of the details uh, of these things. Um, This is going to be be a bit of a flyby. All right, this is, this is, is, we're not going to be able to go into complete detail. Hopefully it's worth it nonetheless. The first and most fundamental objection people have to Constantine is a pretty significant one. Was Constantine even really a Christian? This is understandably quite a substantial question. Uh, Sometimes in the popular imagination, there's this idea that Constantine was just pretending to be a Christian. He saw the way that the tide was turning, and so he hopped on board for political power, for prestige, uh, but that at heart, really, he was still a pagan, uh, and a cynical, power-grabbing pagan at that. So was Constantine a Christian? Now, in one sense, uh, it's very easy to answer that question. He took on the name of Christ to himself. He rode to war under the banner of Christ. It's true that he was only baptized later on in uh, towards the end of his life, uh, very close to his death. But that more than likely reflects some of the views of baptism floating around in the church of late antiquity than anything else. And so in one sense, he was a Christian. The name of Christ was the name he took on himself. The question we really have, uh, that many really have, is was he a faithful Christian? That is, did he possess a true and living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? There are several pieces of uh, of evidence that people tend to point to to argue against that being the case. And we'll look at a few of those together. The first of these is the idea that Constantine was really just a syncretist. He was trying to uh, pull together Jesus with other Roman gods and just mash them together into some sort of politically acceptable uh, religious amalgamation. Um, The main culprit, usually, they say uh, he was a worshipper of Apollo, uh, also known as Sol, uh, the Roman god of the sun, and uh, he just wanted to fuse the two together uh, and make a a mashup. They claim that his conversion was nothing more than an attempt to gain the favor of Christians, to boost his power base, um, and people for this, they point to the continued use of pagan symbolism and iconography in the empire, uh, on coins, architecture, particularly early on in his, his, his reign. 
Now, certainly, uh, official language early on was general, was vague, uh, referring to a general monotheistic divinity uh, rather than specifically mentioning Christ. Uh, Constantine's troops would say a general, fairly vague, yet monotheistic prayer before battle, and not explicitly mentioning Christ or the God of the Bible. Um, However, over time, the iconography becomes, uh, became more and more explicitly Christian. Uh, symbols like the Cairo symbol uh, or, or, or the cross appear more frequently. Um, and by 321, before he's become the emperor of the whole Roman Empire, all pagan symbols have been removed from coins, including the generally monotheistic ones and including the ones associated with Apollo and Sol. In many ways, it seems that the use of pagan symbols, far from being a sign of syncretism for Constantine, became something similar to the way those same pagan symbols were used in late medieval and Renaissance literature and art. Um, no one ought to assume, for example, that Shakespeare was a secret syncretist because he drew on the po poetic potency of classical mythology. Uh, similarly, uh, Constantine, whilst trying to hold a fragile empire together, drew on em uh, imagery with, with poetic potency, tying in his reign with uh, the reign of those uh, perceived good emperors of the past. What should be noted, however, uh, is the contrast between Constantine and the previous emperors. They had all explicitly tied themselves to the divine power of Jupiter and the Roman pantheon. Those tasked with writing words of praise to the glory of the emperors, they were all too eager in the past to extol the great favour that the Roman gods had for the emperor. That all ends abruptly with Constantine. Those same writers, many of whom were the same people, didn't compare the emperor to Jupiter anymore. They knew, even if they didn't know exactly what it was, they knew a major change had happened in how the emperor viewed himself. And lest we're tempted to think that Constantine changing his standard the day before the battle for the city of Rome itself is a small thing, we should note just how important the gods were to the legions of Rome. They had victory because of their gods, or, or so they thought. Their standards, their symbols, were not just signs to pick out people in battles, they were sacred signs of allegiance. An emperor who betrayed the gods of his ancestors on the eve of battle for the sake of a chance of a little political clout with some Christians would show himself not only to be cynical towards the god of the Christians, but also incredibly cynical towards the god of his ancestors, thinking nothing of them either. And that doesn't even remotely fit the description we have of Constantine, either in his early life or after his conversion. He was a, he was a religious man. Uh, and the big change, which I've already briefly mentioned and we'll come back to later, is Constantine's stance towards sacrifice. Official imperial sacrifice to the gods simply ends in many, many ways. That is a big deal. Rome was built on sacrifice. We'll come back to that one a little bit later. Another factor people turn to in this regard to suggest Constantine may not have really been a believer is uh, Constantine's execution of his wife and son. Crispus and Fausta. Uh, shortly after uh, the Council of Nicaea, on his return to Rome, Crispus, Constantine's son to his deceased first wife, uh, himself a junior emperor, died by poison on the island of Pola. Afterwards, Constantine's second wife, Fausta, also died. Uh, the story goes that she was placed in an overheated bath. Uh, this story is used to discredit Constantine's conversion, suggests that he was just like the emperors of old, willing to kill off political rivals with no issue. Uh, the occasion is used to suggest that, just like those pagan emperors of old, he was simply a power-hungry man, bent on using whatever means he could to get and stay on top. Uh, who would execute his own son because of political rivalry, rivalry? Certainly not a Christian, and that's true. That is not a Christian move. But we do need to be careful with this story. If for no other reason than we actually have very, very little information with which to work out what actually happened. Something clearly happened. Crispus and Fausta were dead. But knowing what is hard, judging uh, cases in our own day is difficult when the evidence has not disappeared down the streams of time. Judging the case from the testimony of one contemporary, a far from unbiased contemporary, is borderline impossible. But, but any in, uh, attempt to reconstruct these events, we need to take into account a couple of complicating factors, a couple of facts that might help with this. Uh, firstly, Crispus was not a political rival of Constantine. 
Uh, after all, Crispus's military command, his position as junior emperor, was given to him by Constantine himself. Uh, he was uh, a supporter of Constantine. And that's the first thing. Uh, and secondly, most of the accounts of the events say that Crispus either raped Fausta, or they had an affair, or that Crispus refused to sleep with Fausta, and so she lied about him in much the same way that Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph. The, the worst possible reading of the events is this that Constantine ruthlessly murdered his wife and son for simple political gain or even out of uh, sort of a brutal malice at being slighted, uh, which, if it's true, is a grievous sin uh, and brings, uh, brings things into question. But, but the range of possible readings of these facts is really quite broad. The best possible reading of the facts, however, I think shows Constantine in a very different light. Uh, returning from Rome, he finds that his wife has either been raped by or has been adulterous with his son. Uh, his son is exiled for adultery, uh, which, by the way, is something that Constantine had just done to another man, um, exiled him for adultery. Um, and whilst in exile, Crispus takes what really is the traditional Roman way out of such situations, commits suicide by poison. Meanwhile, Fausta is found to be pregnant, and in shame, she turns to the old Roman practice of abortion by overheated bath, which goes wrong. That We don't know which of those things it could be, but this is just to say... We simply don't have the evidence to know which has happened. We do, however, have biblical principles of justice, witnesses, and presumptions of innocence, which I believe should be applied in this case of judging the dead as it should be applied with judging the living. The final thing I want to briefly touch on when it comes to this question of Constantine's uh, genuineness in his, uh, in his conversion is the fact that Constantine had a pretty large opinion of himself. Um, he seems to have, have, have viewed himself as the liberator of the church, the champion of God, uh, bringing salvation uh, to the citizens of the empire. Uh, in many ways, he seems to have stopped just short of counting himself amongst the apostles in terms of his significance to uh, the history of the church. How can a Christian think so highly of himself? Isn't Christ the champion of God, the one who brings salvation to the Roman Empire? Now, in Constantine's defense, I offer three things. Firstly, Though he was an experienced military commander and politician, he was still a very young Christian, especially early on. Secondly, what the emperor writes in official communications when trying to hold an empire together, and what the official archivists and sycophants write about the emperor, is not necessarily what the emperor really thinks of himself. Certainly, there is evidence that Constantine held uh, much of the pomp and grandiose symbolism of uh, of previous emperors much more lightly uh, than they ever did, suggesting that he viewed himself uh, in a much lower, lower level than they viewed themselves. Um, thirdly, uh, we smuggle in uh, unchristian ideas of our view of, our hist of history and God's work in the world if we refuse to see the fact that Christ does work through means. Uh, and that the people of God are supposed to follow his lead. Uh, we rightly say, for example, that it was King David, uh, the, the, head of, uh, the, the covenant head of God's people, who defeated the Philistines by slaying Goliath. But we miss the fact that all Israel then followed his lead in defeating the rest of the army. Uh, we rightly say that it is King Jesus who brought salvation to the world, including the Roman Empire, and defeated sin, death, and the devil. But we miss the fact that God's people are now called to follow his lead and to do the same way in smaller ways throughout history. Constantine may have thought too highly of his own significance. In fact, I'm willing to say he really did think too highly of his own significance. However, let's not forget that he was actually really significant. He was the Roman emperor, and he had given freedom to the gospel in a large part of the world. Fourth, uh, let's not, not forget what his predecessors thought of themselves. Uh, he might have thought of himself as almost an apostle, uh, almost an apostle, the, uh, his predecessors um, thought of themselves as the power of Jupiter incarnate. To go from the power of Jupiter incarnate to the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and defender of his people, the church, is actually, in Roman emperor terms, a massive downgrade, and one that Constantine willingly took. It is therefore my opinion that Constantine was a real believer, and actually that we'd need far more evidence to the contrary to judge otherwise, if nothing else. Uh, the second segment of objections to Constantine I want to deal with is, is the idea that Constantine essentially bought out the church. Um, that the church from the days of Constantine onwards has become a sort of a tame puppy that was unwilling to speak prophetically to power. 
uh, and was really just the, the sort of left hand of, uh, of the imperial throne. So that's where we're going to turn now. Uh, did Constantine buy out the church so that it was unwilling to challenge him? It is claimed by some that Constantine's conversion essentially marked the fall of a pure church that was willing to speak the truth to power, and that from this point on, the church essentially becomes the imperial bootlicker, um, a tool in the hands of the emperor for political ends. Now, it ought to be granted that this temptation is a temptation for God's people, and always has been. It was clearly a temptation for the Pharisees in Jesus' day. It has been the temptation of many churchmen throughout the ages. It has also been a temptation of many statesmen as well to try and get the church to be a department of state. This temptation is real, and in some times and places it has been a real problem. The issue with Constantine, however, is whether this moment marks the wholesale selling out of the church to power in square, scare quotes. Whether from this point forward, all the way until maybe the Enlightenment, or a thousand years later, or beyond, bishops, pastors, the church institution just became the left hand of imperial power. Quite bluntly, the answer to that question is no. Christian writers at the time, despite uh, the faith of the emperor, had many choice words to say to the emperor. Uh, the Bishop Athanasius, uh, who would become one of the most significant figures in church history, was exiled several times by the Emperor Constantine for refusing to just go along with what the Emperor said. Uh, and that pattern continued in the years after Constantine as well, uh, throughout the centuries afterwards. Um, in the year 390, for example, the Emperor Theodosius was excommunicated from the church by Ambrose, the Bishop of Milan, uh, for the way he'd crushed uh, opposition in Thessalonica. Imagine the courage there to say to the emperor of Rome, you are not coming into this church and taking communion. To his credit, Theodosius repented. Um, so to suggest that Constantine's conversion was the moment that the church became a toady of the emperor is, is just patently absurd. Uh, to be honest, it's quite a rich criticism coming from a moment like ours in the church's history, uh, when many significant world leaders are still members in good standing of their churches, despite pursuing openly things like abortion, and a time when many churches have spent the last few years bending over backwards to go along with the government in many, many ways. The temptation to become a Department of State is a continual temptation, but to assume that conversion of Constantine was a great fall in this regard, that has led to over a millennium of church subjugation to imperial power and nothing else, is simply false. And regardless, to subscribe to such a view requires you to deny that God, by his Holy Spirit, is at work in the preservation of his church. Something categorically unbiblical uh, to deny. Uh, the next accusation levied against Constantine is that he gathered the bishops at Nicaea in order to sort of enforce a top-down control over the doctrine of the church. Uh, to seize control of the church for himself and set the agenda. Uh, to set the boundaries of heresy and orthodoxy for his own ends. Uh, as, we, uh, as we saw earlier, uh, the Council of Nicaea there in 325 is one of the key moments in the life of Constantine and of the church in those first centuries. Um, the leaders of the church being given freedom uh, to gather publicly, openly, and then the protection of the emperor uh, as they do that was an incredible change in fortune. And it's rightly been celebrated throughout church history. But was it just a ploy? Was it just the emperor forcing the church into his own mould? Well, certainly, if it was, he did a really very bad job of it. The council was far from a neat and tidy exercise of top-down military imperial power. Uh, neither, uh, and the years afterwards, the aftermath of that council would also not a nice, neat, tidy exercise of top-down coercive imperial power. Uh, the proceedings of the council, uh, they look like a mess in many ways. But what they look like is the organic discussion of people who are faithful by and large, trying to work out the issue at hand to declare what is true. And remember, remember the words of that creed of, of 325. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. The council essentially delivered to Constantine a creed that relegated him below another Lord and proclaimed the church's primary allegiance to another. Now, it's fair to say, I think, that Constantine made some errors when it came to the use of civic power in the aftermath uh, of various controversies. Uh, there are times when he was too heavy-handed, times when he was too, uh, and also times on the other, other end of things, when he was too keen for sort of peace, peace, when there was no peace, a cheap unity. 
Uh, but we need to remember that this was the first time the church had dealt with this situation, and also the first time Constantine himself had dealt uh, with this situation. Uh, his errors were unfortunately high stakes by the nature of his office um, as the emperor. But remember, he was a human, and humans learn from experience. And so did Constantine. There was a good deal of trial and error, changing his mind, learning through his years as emperor. I, I think you can see this uh, with how he dealt with, uh, with Arius and Athanasius, that I mentioned earlier, um, two, two of the key players in that Arian controversy and the aftermath of the Council of Nicaea. Early on in the controversy, Constantine doesn't seem to really grasp the, uh, the gravity of the issue, suggesting uh, sometimes that they are arguing sort of over a trivial matter. It's a sort of just, guys, come and get on. You're going you're gonna to ruin things uh, and, and make things very difficult to handle. Um, his tone is conciliatory, seeking unity above all. Later, however, his opposition against Arius becomes much, much clearer, uh, as does his admiration for Athanasius and his zeal for the truth, despite having uh, exiled him several times. Uh, and, and also his commitment to Nicene orthodoxy becomes much more clear. Uh, did the uh, ascension of Constantine to the imperial throne uh, signal the end of pure spiritual church for millennium to come? No. Did he try and force church doctrine into his own mold? No, he didn't. Uh, this brings us now onto the third and final category of objections that I want to touch on. Uh, Constantine may have been a Christian himself, and he may not have compromised the church, but was his rule a distinctively Christian rule? That is... Was his rule different from the way a pagan would rule? The first thing to consider here is whether there can be such a thing as a Christian ruler. This is, uh, that is, can a civic ruler rule the civil realm in a distinctly Christian way? Some would condemn Constantine for even attempting to do that, whether or not he was successful. And now there's a lot we could get into here about the form of Christian government, the methods of pursuing Christian government. All of that is to some extent beyond the scope of this session. We do, however, need to deal with the fundamentals of the situation. I think we can get a, a, get a basic answer to the question with another series of fairly basic questions. Is there such a thing as a ruler ruling in a distinctly Christian way? That's the basic question. The series of basic questions that might lead us to an answer well, what else would a ruler who became a Christian do? Would they separate their, uh, their, their obedience to Christ into little compartments of their lives? Would they be forced to stand down from any civil office they held? Is the gospel inherently not for civil rulers in case one of them becomes a Christian? Clearly, this isn't the case. Uh, in the New Testament itself, the apostles go to civil rulers often in order to preach the gospel to them. Paul even going so far as to head for the imperial court in Rome to get an audience there. And I think we'd have to be pretty far off the reservation to assume that they really didn't want those rulers to become Christians. And then uh, to bring them to the obedience of faith in every part of their life, including in their civil offices. However, even if we conclude that a distinctly Christian way of wielding civil authority is possible, which I do, we're still left with the question of whether Constantine was an example of such a Christian rule. And that's where things get a little bit more complicated. Was Constantine's legislation, was his policy Christian? And, and again, I don't have too much on this, which you may be very thankful for. Um, we don't have time to go into an extensive survey of his policies on slavery, inheritance, marriage law. Uh, certainly, his record on these things was a mixed bag, uh, both by biblical standards uh, and by the altogether much less important standard of modern sensibilities. Certainly, the framing of his edicts were very rarely explicitly Christian, uh, though it seems that they were often impacted by Christian polemics of the time. There's one in particular that we'll get to uh, in, a, in a moment. But even if the explicit text of the legislation wasn't Christian per se, the long-term effect of them was. Churches were built, tax exemptions were given to Christian bishops, uh, and many Christians, even many low-born Christians, uh, found themselves in positions of significant authority within the, emperor, uh, within the empire for the first time. And as we said before, um, he was the first major Christian ruler, certainly the first Christian ruler over such a large and complex domain. He was uh, starting to answer questions for the first time. We ought not to expect all his answers to be as refined as we might like. 
But the biggest policy change, the biggest deeply Christian policy change, is also the one that will lead us now back into our discussion of the general significance of the story of Constantine, I think, for the history, uh, for history and for the history of the church. The biggest policy change is one we've already alluded to. Constantine was decidedly anti-sacrifice. He closed down significant pagan temples. He certainly outlawed many, if not all, of the official pagan sacrifices that accompanied state occasions. Uh, But there's one form of sacrifice we don't often recognize as sacrifice that he moved against pretty decisively. And that was the bloody offering poured out on the sands of the arena. Gladiatorial combat had been Rome's way of offering human sacrifice. It, offered, it operated as a sacred display of Roman virtue, military prowess, courage, whilst guaranteeing the steady flow of blood which secured Rome's ideals and assuaged uh, both the gods and the mob. As such, contemporary Christian politics against gladiatorial combat are well represented amongst the writings of the early church fathers. Uh, in 325, Constantine decreed that gladiatorial combat was to end. And though the nature of the imperial edicts mean that the gladiatorial games probably still happened somewhere in the empire, it is significant that when Constantine set up his new capital at Constantinople, he did not build an arena. Instead, he built a hippodrome for horse and chariot racing. Rome was founded on sacrifice. In the mythic past, Aeneas defeated Turnus, and the blood of that conquest sowed the seeds of the great destiny of the household of Aeneas. Later, in the myths of Rome, the city itself was founded by the sacrifice of Remus by by his brother Romulus, his blood securing the boundary of the city. The sacred empire was sustained at home by continual sacrifice to Jupiter and by sacrifice to Mars on the frontier as the holy legions of Rome spilled the blood of the barbarians. Though the temple of Rome, temples of Rome never quite embraced the practice of human sacrifice as so many other civilizations did, the arena certainly did. The sacrifice was essential, for the gods had favored Aeneas, and they had promised him for his piety and the piety of his descendants the throne above all thrones. The Roman throne would be the throne of the cosmos, and history was to be the story of Rome. Sacrifice held that vision together. The favor of those gods secured the future. Rome was built on sacrifice. This then was the chief achievement of Constantine and the chief repentance of his own life and the chief repentance of Rome. He realized that these gods were nothing for the future of Rome. He realized that those sacrifices secured no hope for his people. And ultimately, he understood that the story of Rome was not going to be the story of history anymore. He came to understand that there is only one God who could give Rome any sort of future. That there was only one sacrifice that could provide hope and salvation for his people. And he realized that if there was going to be any glory for Rome, any part that the offspring of Aeneas could play in the grand story of the universe, then the household of Aeneas must relinquish its claim and bow before the firstborn son of the household of Abraham. The prophets and oracles of Rome were always false prophets. Only one God had true prophets, and Rome should have listened to them. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw one like a son of man. In his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." The call to Constantine on that day in 312 AD was the same call that comes to all rulers, ancient, modern, and all in between. The same call that comes to all who would have peace for their people, true peace, who would have everlasting glory, real glory, and some small share in the inheritance of the nations. Now, O rulers, be wise and kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Constantine heard that call 
and humbled himself. And so though in many ways Rome died that day, Rome lived on in a far better way. And for that one mighty work amongst many, uh, may the Lord Jesus Christ be praised forever. Amen. Good, right, we're, uh, we're going to pray and then uh, we'll have lunch. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for these two stories uh, of uh, your faithfulness to your church this morning. We thank you for these people in our past, uh, fathers in our faith, who you have given us as a gift. We, play, we pray that you would help us to learn the lessons that we ought from their lives, and most of all, to glorify you, to praise your name, and to lift our hearts, our voices in worship to you uh, for the things that you have done uh, in this world. Father, we thank you for the food we're about to share together, and we pray that you'd bless it to us and give us a time of joy together. Amen.